Hi there, I'm Logan Medish, and this is High Caliber History. In the mid to late 19th century, in an era before the invention of swing out cylinders on revolvers, the top brake revolver made quite the splash. Faster and easier to load and unload than guns like the Colt Single Action Army, which had a singular loading gate, top brake guns could be accessed with the quick flick of a lever. Companies began producing scores of these guns under all sorts of brand and trade names. And Hopkins and Allen was no exception. Founded by a couple of investors, as well as the company's namesakes, brothers Charles and Samuel Hopkins and Charles Allen shortly after the Civil War, the company started off by buying and absorbing the former revolver maker Bacon Manufacturing Company. In 1871, Hopkins and Allen became the sole agent for Merwin Hulbert and Company. They acquired the shotgun company Bay State Arms from William H. Davenport, whose name is often seen on affordable shotguns of the era in 1887. The 1890s saw further diversification into the rifle and bicycle markets, as well as separation from the Hulbert brothers, but business was still good. That is, until there was a massive fire that destroyed the factory in 1900. As their luck would have it, the Forehand Firearms Company was going out of business, and so they bought all of the forehand machinery, and by 1902, the company had peaked with some 600 employees and was the third largest gun maker in the United States. In 1908, the company introduced their newest addition to the revolver lineup the Triple Action Safety Police Revolver. Of course, we all know about single and double action revolver operation, but what is this so-called triple action? It's all about a hinged catch that's part of the hammer that repositions the hammer into a resting position above the firing pin and on the solid frame when the gun is not cocked. The first action is the cocking of the hammer, which lowers it down into line with the firing pin. The second action is the hammer falling on the firing pin. And the third action is when the trigger is released, the trigger bar engages the hinged catch on the hammer and raises the hammer up off of the firing pin so that it rests on the solid frame. The hammer cannot physically contact the firing pin unless the gun is cocked. So those three actions of this triple action safety police revolver are what give it its name. Now the hinge that holds the barrel in place uh, onto the frame was also touted by the company as the strongest available on the market. They called it the Hercules solid joint and it operates with two latch bars similar in design to alligator clips. When the front of both is pressed in, they disengage from the frame and allow the barrel and cylinder to break open to access the rounds. Removal of the cylinder for cleaning and maintenance was also easily accomplished. With the gun broken open, there's another alligator clip bar on the left side of the frame ahead of the cylinder. When pressed, it frees the lever from a collar on the cylinder, and then the cylinder can simply be pulled out of the frame. Reassembly is just as simple in the exact opposite order. Unlike many companies today, where blued guns are the standard and nickel ones command a premium, the opposite was true for Hopkins and Allen. They were regarded as having the best nickel plating process in the business in their day. And as such, it was their standard finish. Guns like this one with a blued finish cost an extra 50 cents on top of the standard price of $7.50. And then you can take it a step further. Factory engraved guns, like this one, were added to their catalog in 1911, and they feature approximately 85% coverage. The catalog for that year notes that, quote, the engraving is handwork of highest grade, done by an expert engraver. Unfortunately, the identity of the engraver is unknown. Now, the engraved guns had a cost of $11, with an extra 50 cents for the blued finish, and the logoed Mother of Pearl grips were an additional $1.50, bringing the total cost of this 32 caliber five-shot revolver to $13, or approximately $370 today. These engraved models were only available for four years, from 1911 to 1915, 
when Hopkins and Allen ceased all production on civilian guns to work on a World War I rifle contract for Belgium that would ultimately be the company's demise. They were ill-prepared in terms of money and machinery, but the final blow came when Albert F. Rockwell left Hopkins and Allen for Marlin, where they then formed the Marlin Rockwell Company and secured a contract with Brigadier General William Crozier to make Browning automatic rifles. Except that Marlin didn't have all the machinery to do so. Rockwell and Crozier joined forces, and Crozier denied government subsidization of the Hopkins and Allen Belgian contract, which forced the company into federal trusteeship. With Hopkins and Allen's factory now closed, Marlin Rockwell swooped in to pick up the pieces. After the war, the factory sat idle until 1921, when the machinery was officially sold off to Marlin and the building was sold to a textile company, thereby officially ending Hopkins and Allen. It's a sort of sad fate for a company that had been one of the top three arms makers in the United States. But at any rate, their triple action safety police revolvers stand as a testament to the high quality craftsmanship that they were capable of creating at their peak in the first decades of the 20th century. And it's a far cry from the reputation that they have acquired in recent decades as being second rate guns. So let me know in the comments below what you think about Hopkins and Allen guns and their quality, and if this changed your mind about some of their design and how you see them as collectible guns on the market. I hope you enjoyed this video. I really appreciate you watching. Uh, please give it a thumbs up, leave me a comment, subscribe to the channel if you're not, and share it with someone you think might enjoy it. Thanks again for watching. I'm Logan Medish. Have a great day.